The season started amid speculation over the immediate future of Alain Prost. Fired from Ferrari at the end of 91, he was thought to be on the verge of joining the Ligier team. He did a lot of winter testing, often disguised in other drivers' helmets, but eventually decided against joining the team. He took a sabbatical year instead. In other teams, there were many changes. Ferrari restructured their team after a poor 91 and brought their former world champion Niki Lauda in as the team advisor. On the driver's front, Ivan Capelli joined Jean Alesi. Tyrrell was reshaped as well. Two new drivers, Olivier Grillard and Andrea de Cesaris, will be powered by Ilmore's V10 engine. The same engine was to propel Paul Belmondo and Carl Wendlinger driving for the underfinanced March team under the guidance of the designer Gustav Brunner. Brabham introduced the first lady driver in Formula One in 15 years. Giovanna Amati found her transition into Formula One somewhat difficult. Well, technically the car is uh, really faster. The gearbox is completely different. The brakes are completely different. The engine, the use of the engine is different. The grip of the, the tires, everything. I mean, everything, everything. The 1991 Formula 3000 champion, Christian Fittipaldi, was another newcomer. The 21-year-old joined the Minardi team, watched closely by his father, the former Brabham driver, Wilson, and advised by his uncle, Emerson, the former double world champion. At Minardi, he replaced Pierluigi Martini, who went to Italian neighbours Dallara. Former sports car world champion Martin Brundle finally got his big chance by joining the Benetton team. But his task would not be easy, with the rising star Michael Schumacher already well established within the team. Outstanding debutants in 1991 Jordan was another totally reorganised team for the new season. They had two new drivers in Stefano Modena and Maurizio Gugelmin, and even more significantly, the new engine, Yamaha's V12. Venturi LaRousse introduced a new Japanese star in Ukiyo Katayama, and the Swiss Andrea Chiesa was learning Formula One with the Fon Metal team. But of course, um, I try to not, uh, I mean, I try to always look in the mirrors and uh, try to let pass other people quicker than me. Was a big, I mean, big surprise first, uh, first time that the Senna passed me. <laughs> it saw, I, I saw that I was watching the TV. <laughs> the Brazilian triple world champion knew from the outset he would be facing a tough year. Last season, he'd struggled but succeeded to hold off Nigel Mansell in the Williams Renault. But this year, he felt, would be even harder. We all have seen last year the fight has been great between all of us. And I think uh, perhaps we'll have another season like that. Ayrton sitting here is going to be formidable this year, as he has been the last couple of years. So it's, it's real early days yet. Senna and McLaren were facing not only Mansell's determination, but the most sophisticated package in the pit lane. Fully developed active suspension, semi-automatic gearbox and traction control. Here's how the teams lined up. Ayrton Senna, the defending world champion, with McLaren. Gerhard Berger, his McLaren teammate. Olivier Guillaume of France for Tyrrell. Alongside Andrea de Cesaris of Italy. Britain's Nigel Mansell with Williams. Riccardo Patrese, his Williams teammate. Eric van der Poel and Giovanna Amati, the Brabham lineup. Michele Alboreto for footwork with Aguri Suzuki of Japan. Mika Hakkinen for Lotus with Johnny Herbert of Great Britain. Andrea Chiesa of Switzerland for Fon Metal, alongside Italian Gabriel Tarquini. Carl Wendlinger for March, with Frenchman Paul Belmondo. The battling German Michael Schumacher for Benetton, alongside the experienced British driver Martin Brundle. JJ Leto of Finland for Dallara, with the Italian Pierluigi Martini. Christian Fittipaldi, Minardi. Gianni Morbidelli, his Minardi teammate. The Ligier lineup, Thierry Boutsen of Belgium, Eric Comas of France. Jean Alesi of France for Ferrari, with the Italian Ivan Capelli. For Venturi, Bertrand Gascho of Belgium, Ukio Katayama of Japan.
and the Jordan lineup, Stefano Modena and the Brazilian Maurizio Gujelman. Formula One returns to South Africa for the first time since 1985, but Kyle Army is a much revised and modernized circuit. Seven years ago, on the old circuit, Nigel Mansell scored his second ever Grand Prix win in a dominant style. It was a prelude to two years in which Mansell came very close to winning the world title, but never quite managed it. But he remained a very popular man in South Africa and the country was quick to revive its keen interest in Formula One. This display, here today, you can see the crowds outside. The interest is there, and where, is the, where you have the interest and the support from the public, the, the gladiators come forward. Qualifying was an interesting affair, with some novices, like the Italian lady Giovanna Ramati and her Brabham, struggling for most of the time. Nigel Mansell, on the other hand, was in devastating form. Right from the start of the weekend, he dominated qualifying, losing no time in showing everybody that he and his Renault-powered Williams were going to be the force to beat this year. He completely dominated both sessions and beat the world champion Ayrton Senna comfortably to take the 18th pole position of his career. On this Kyle Army circuit, Mansell knew that the first start of the season would be all important. At the green light, he outsprinted Senna into the first corner to take the lead, exactly as he did seven years ago. For Senna, the writing was on the wall when Ricardo Patrese and the other Williams pushed his way through to second place, and together with Mansell, started to vanish into the distance. First lap brought more drama when Martin Brundle's Benetton touched Andrea de Cesaris's Tyrrell and spun. Brundle restarted, but retired soon after with a broken clutch. Ferrari's season started dismally, with first Ivan Capelli and then Jean Alesi retiring with engine problems. By that time, Mansell's lead over Patrese and Senna was more than 20 seconds, and he was busy lapping slower cars supported avidly by the fans. Behind the leading trio, the young German Michael Schumacher, driving his seventh Grand Prix in a Benetton, drove steadily to finish fourth. Lotus driver Johnny Herbert scored his best result in three years, finishing a very promising sixth. So after the potential of the previous year, it was a perfect one-two for the Williams team. Mansell was never really threatened, and Patrese successfully fended off Senna's challenge to finish 10 seconds ahead of the Brazilian. It was a question of pushing very hard and trying to build up a little bit of a gap and then managing it. Uh, Ayrton was pressuring Ricardo, obviously, halfway through the race because I was pushing quite hard later on and was not going away. And then it was just a question of uh, trying to have a bit of spare time with the traffic, but the traffic was uh, pretty good. <laughs> Three weeks later, Formula One crossed the Atlantic and came to Mexico City. Nigel Mansell made an early inspection of the track, giving his thoughts on the Peraltada corner. And because it's such a fast corner, it's going to make it mighty dangerous, because if you get on the marbles and you're in fifth or sixth gear, you know, your history, you're going to go off. Mansell survived this nasty moment, but he was open in his criticism of the track. The bumps are terrible and you're fighting for control all the time and I mean it's not nice feeling because it's an accident waiting to happen all the time. Indeed Senna, who had a major accident here in 91, hit the bump on Friday and lost control. The Brazilian was in considerable pain from an injured leg. However, he would be fit enough to drive again on Saturday, on his 32nd birthday, and qualify a brave sixth on the grid.
his role of being the main threat to the Williamses was taken on by Benetton and by Michael Schumacher. The team were delighted and Michael's confidence rose with every lap he drove. Mansell took pole position once again, but this time Patrese was just fractionally slower and Schumacher was less than a second adrift. With the Englishman having won here five years ago, but being beaten by Patrese fair and square in 1991 after a big battle, the race seemed wide open. At the start, however, Mansell pulled away clearly. But in the midfield, chaos reigned as Carl Wendlinger hit Capelli's Ferrari and sent him into the wall. Mansell led into the first corner, and all Patrese could do was watch the tail of the other Williams once again. Capelli, meanwhile, was eager to get back to his pit, as Wendlinger paid a little more attention to the march. Mansell led Patrese, Senna and Brundle. Schumacher recovered from a bad start by forcing Berger out of fifth spot. The German would soon pass Brundle for fourth, and it became third place when Senna's transmission broke on the 12th lap. For more than half of the race, Berger and Brundle bitterly disputed fourth place. The Englishman was in truly inspired mood. And a spectating Senna found it all rather amusing. But Ferrari's star, Jean Alesi, found the lack of his car's straight line speed appalling when de Cesaris easily passed him on lap 30. The Frenchman's engine would expire two laps later. And the same thing happened to a frustrated Martin Brundle, 20 laps from home. But it was no problems for Mansell, apart from a smashed mirror, and he easily scored his second win of the year. He eased off towards the end, allowing Patrese to come closer, while Schumacher stepped on the winner's podium for the first time. And he adapted well to the role, proving a tough man with a champagne. But after the race, most had only one question in mind. It looked fairly easy, was it? <laughs> no, it wasn't. The Brazilian Grand Prix for the third consecutive year at Interlagos. Mansell's early season dominance made him very popular even in Senna's hometown of Sao Paulo. The world champion, though, was keen to repeat his 1991 win on the Interlagos track. Reacting to Williams's crushing start, McLaren had brought six cars to Brazil, including three brand new MP47s. All that was in vain, however, as Mansell again utterly dominated qualifying. Until Saturday afternoon, that is, when he had this moment of truth with Ayrton Senna. Here's Nigel's version of events. I mean, it's just one of those silly racing accidents that uh, I misread. I thought Ayrton was going to let me through on first the one corner, and then I thought, right, is speeding up to go out of the way in the other corner, and he pulled right over to the right, and I had enough momentum to slingshot out of the corner. And then, unfortunately, uh, I don't think then he saw me there, and he pulled over, and um, he didn't leave me any room to come back. So it's just one of those things. Definitely, there was a misunderstanding, but I, I honestly believe it was his own misunderstanding, his own misjudgment on uh, where to try to overtake, uh, when, and so on. Uh, I only saw that something happened to him when I was out of the corner already, and it happened under braking at that corner when we were both going slow. So I don't know what happened with him. We never touch, you know. But uh, of course, something went wrong for him and he probably lost the car and as a consequence hit the wall. As all of Brazil was gearing up for the race, the question arose on Saturday afternoon whether Mansell would be able to start the race. But by Sunday morning, it was clear he would, as his injuries were only minor. 
Mansell's 20th pole position was a major achievement as he was more than a second faster than Patrese and more than two seconds faster than Senna. Could anybody stop Mansell? Was the new McLaren a technological match for the Williams? That's what Senna was certainly thinking about as he prepared to start his home race. For once, Mansell had too much wheel spin, and Patrese reached the first corner leading. Senna started well, but once again he could only watch the Williamses as they pulled away. After several laps, Senna, with his car proving very quick on the straight, was trailing a large group of pursuers led by Schumacher, and the young German wasn't at all happy about it. Alton was uh, quite slow. I was always quicker than him, but there was no chance to, to overtake him. And then he started, uh, I would say, after 10 laps, he started to play a game. Uh, like, uh, I don't know. He, he knew he, he couldn't finish, and he just break us in the slow corner where no chance was to overtake. In the straight, he, he just uh, go in the throttle back and drove away from us. And once there was a situation, he let me pass, came in the uh, slipstream and passed me back just to do it like this, that uh, somebody else can, can overtake me, you know. And I'm really upset about Ayrton. I think it is not really necessary for, for a three times world champion to do something like this. It all ended on lap 17, when Senna was terminally stopped by electrical problems, retiring from his second race in a row. Patrese and Mansell, meanwhile, had their own private battle in front. It intensified as they started to lap slower cars, but the championship leader never managed to pass his teammate until the tyre stops. Mansell came in first and was stationary for some 8.5 seconds. This was a second faster than Patrese's stop, and it was enough to give Mansell the lead in the race. Behind Schumacher, the fourth-placed battle between Alesi and Brundle ended in tears. The same spot, six laps later. Two Ligiers, Comas and Bootsen, disputing the same bit of tarmac. And they eliminated Johnny Herbert in the process as well. With Patrese unable to make any impression, Nigel Mansell cruised to yet another win, the 24th of his career. With their third double on the trot, the Williams team were firmly on their way towards the 1992 World Championship after only three races. Nigel Mansell grabbed the championship lead firmly in his hands, with 12 points more than his teammate, a further seven more than Schumacher. In Brazil, he lapped the entire field, save for Patrese, and his form could only be described as frightening. Round three in the Olympic city of Barcelona. Normally the country of color and sun, Spain this time welcomed Formula One with heavy rains that dominated both final qualifying and the race. Predictably, Mansell was fastest on Friday in a time that turned out to be good for yet another pole position. It rained on Saturday and the track was half a minute slower. In the rain, the Englishman was not fastest. It was Jean Alesi. The slower track helped to disguise all the deficiencies of his Ferrari and Alesi skillfully outpaced Mansell and the others by almost a second. But all his hard work in the rain didn't help him much, however, since he was still only eighth fastest on a dry track. Schumacher was to start the race from the front row for the first time in his short career, but he was still a full second slower than Mansell. Just before the start, more rain forced everybody to change tyres on the grid, but at least it seemed the wet track would be a welcome equaliser. And Lacey started perfectly, some said too perfectly, but Mansell and Patrese held their positions and once again led the pack. 
Senna made an untypically bad start and found himself seventh into the first corner. But he immediately passed his teammate Berger and then quickly disposed of Brundle as well to start a race-long chase after Schumacher. Berger's attempt to deal with Alesi in the same way ended like this. Alesi's acrobatics cost him his tyres and he had to call in to change them halfway through the race. But once the Ferrari mechanics had given him his fresh rubber, his was to be a very inspiring race. The same cannot be said for Patrese's race. He was to mark up the Williams team's first retirement of the season. Closing on Hakkinen to lap him, he lost it. With the Ferrari people watching his every move, Jean Alesi kept on moving up the field, despite occasional hiccups. And Hakkinen was the culprit again. Towards the end of the race, the conditions became so bad that even Senna, a renowned rainmaster, first spun and then crashed for good from his third place. Mansell, however, never put a foot wrong and won masterfully. It was his 25th career win which put him equal to the great Scot, Jim Clark. With four wins from four starts, he also equaled Senna's record from 91. Schumacher continued his rise and finished second in only his 10th Grand Prix, while Jean Alesi finally gave Ferrari something to cheer about by taking third after Senna's demise. They were wet with rain, and now they could be wet with the traditional champagne. Michele Alboreto gave Team Footwork their best ever result, while Pierluigi Martini scored the first point for Dallara Ferrari. With the conditions, you had to be very careful how to overtake, because you couldn't blame the driver in front, because he could see nothing behind. And it was uh, sometimes uh, very difficult to overtake, but uh, an incredible race. In the points race, Mansell pulled further away from everybody while Schumacher started to worry Patrese. World champion Ayrton Senna was seemingly out of contention. In the team standings, Williams were by now totally on their own, but surprisingly, in second place, it was not McLaren, but Benetton. Ferrari climbed to four. I had a, a lot of problems uh, during the race, but <coughs> I think for Ferrari, for uh, Imola race, it was very important to finish uh, on the, on the podium because uh, uh, all, all the Tifos in Italy are following uh, Ferrari. Also, of course, uh, all the other drivers and, the, and especially Niger because he's very popular in Italy. Fans came to Imola in their thousands. There were celebrity fans such as Olympic skiing champion Alberto Tomba and former Ferrari driver René Arnoux. There was Italian film star Dalila Di Lazzaro and fashion giant Luciano Benetton and his former driver Alessandro Nanini. But when the real business started, it was Mansell who again stole the limelight. During Friday qualifying, he demolished all his rivals with another fantastic lap which clinched his fifth pole position in a row. He may not have been driving a Ferrari, but ever since his days with the Scuderia, the Tifosi in Italy have taken him to their hearts. They call him Il Leone. I make in a motori argi, lavora molto perfetto, molto molto contento. He was again more than a second faster than Riccardo Petrezzi. Senna's McLaren improved, but obviously not enough, and others were too far behind to pose any serious threat. Well, the Ferraris were back on the fourth row, but the fans didn't seem to mind too much. But at the start, Mansell did it once again. With Petrezzi firmly covering his back, he was already pulling away as the field rushed down to the Tosa bend. 
Brundle had started well as he outsprinted both his teammate Schumacher and Berger. And after failing to finish in any of the first four races, the 1988 World Sports Car Champion seemed today to be on better form with his German teammate. Schumacher tried everything he knew to pass Brundle, but on lap 19 he overdid it in the double left-handed Ravazza corner. He didn't want his day's motor racing to be over, but the damage to his Benetton suspension was too much. Alesi was going well in the leading Ferrari, but the McLarens wound him in. He let Senna through to third place quite easily, but he was in no mood to repeat it with Berger. To the dismay of the Italian fans, one of the Ferraris was out. It took the marshals a while to clear the track, but they managed it, and the race was not stopped. So, as the race went on, Jean Alesi had cheers as he ran home. At Imola, they cheer a Ferrari driver, no matter what happens. There was another scare when the Japanese Ukiyo Katayama lost a part of the bodywork from his LaRousse Venturi. The bodywork was finally picked up by a brave marshal, but Nigel Mansell passed by a little too close for comfort. The Tifosi saw no reason for staying any longer. There were no Ferraris left in the race, Capelli had also spun off, and Nigel Mansell was leading by a mile. For Frank Williams and his technical director Patrick Head, the race was as absorbing as ever. And they were able to watch Nigel Mansell come up to the line to take his record-breaking fifth win. Five starts, five wins, a new record for Nigel Mansell. Patrese closed in the dying laps, but he could do no more. Senna finished a distant third and in agony. He suffered from severe cramps and shoulder pain and couldn't get out of the car until long after the race. So the podium celebration was an all-Williams affair. And as ever, both Mansell and Patrese clearly enjoyed every moment of it. I mean, we made history today, five in a row. And it's uh, a complete tribute to the engineering, to the engineers, and to everybody who works uh, with and for the team. Uh, I dedicate this win to them and the, uh, the historic victory. For Senna, who was now trailing the Englishman by a massive 42 points, but who'd seen one of his records broken, it had been a day to forget. For him, another very frustrating and painful race. Then it was off to the south of France for the 50th Monaco Grand Prix. Some like it for its glamour and party going, some like it because it's simply a demanding place to race. But Monaco is more than ever the jewel in the Formula One calendar, an event where past and present drivers meet, a place to see and to be seen. The race hasn't produced many winners in the past eight years, just two, Prost and Senna and many wondered, would this tradition be broken? Well, as soon as qualifying started, it seemed very much that it would be. Nigel Mansell was in a class of his own, both on Thursday and on Saturday. On the track where he'd first led a Grand Prix eight years before, but where he'd never managed to win, he flew around at shattering speed. On this toughest and bumpiest of circuits, he took full benefit of his car's active suspension. Both he and team owner Frank Williams were thrilled afterwards. I used both my new sets of tyres and I didn't think it was possible to go quicker. And I went out on my first set again because that had the fewest laps on. And I actually got a clear lap, a totally clear lap, and I just hung it out everywhere. And I put it together and it popped up 19.4. I mean, what can I say except I'm elated? Again, Mansell was almost a second faster than anybody else. 
Senna was third on the track where he'd lost only once since 1987. Coming to the grid a little late in company with his brother, Senna looked almost confident. It was quite the opposite with Mansell. But for the Englishman, it was business as usual from the very start. Senna elbowed past Patrese into the Santa Vote corner, but he could do nothing about Mansell. Up the hill to the casino square, Mansell had already started to pull slightly away. And when they reached the harbour, he was in a race on his own. Up until eight laps from the end, it would be like that. Mansell leading comfortably, Senna trying to stay in touch just in case. He knew well that anything could happen in Monaco. For Ivan Capelli, that anything happened on lap 60. He lost it just before the Rascasse, and it was yet another bitter disappointment for the Ferrari driver. Ten laps later, Mansell's smooth run was over. Suspecting a puncture, he rushed into the pits. We had uh, a longer pit stop than, than normal, and uh, as I came out the pit, I could see Ethan go by. And I knew then that uh, the race was probably lost. But Easy to pass Senna in the corners, especially at Monaco. flag and the race belonged to Ayrton Senna. He won by a mere 0.2 of a second but it was his fifth win in Monaco and he equaled Graham Hill's 22 year old record. Understandably he was more than delighted after the race. Not only had he finally won a race but he'd also stopped that demolishing winning streak of Mansell's. As for Mansell, he'd lost another Monaco, but his championship lead over his nearest rival, Patrese, had actually increased to 28 points now. From Monaco to Montreal, the Canadian Grand Prix. Fresh from his Monaco triumph, Senna let it be known that he was back into challenging winning form. He dominated the Friday qualifying session leaving Mansell only fourth fastest. On Saturday, Mansell was faster than Senna and faster than everyone else. But the track was now considerably slower, so that Senna was fastest overall. And he was watched by two interested guests at McLaren, Mario and Michael Andretti. Senna clinched the 61st pole position of his career and for the sake of the 1992 World Championship everybody hoped he would increase his point score here. Most unusually Mansell would start the race from the second row of the grid. It promised to be very interesting. The top five qualifiers were covered by less than a second. So to the race. And at the green light Mansell started well but he just failed to pass Senna into the first corner. He tried to do it several times in the first few laps, but Senna calmly employed his Monaco tactics and stayed ahead. Nigel was getting fed up with seeing the back of a McLaren for the second race running. And Senna even eased away a little bit. Meanwhile, further down the field, the LaRousse Venturi drivers Gasho and Katayama were involved in a rather destructive fratricidal tussle over 12th place. But on lap 15, Mansell did even worse, crashing out for good. Gerhard Berger saw the whole thing. Nigel tried to overtake uh, Ayrton on the end of the straight, just coming into the chicken before the start finish line. And, I mean, I was thinking before to do the same with Patrese, but we all know that it's very dirty inside. And if you go break later, you have a good chance to go straight over the thing, and that's exactly what's happened. He, he tried to overtake him, and then break late. He tried to break late, I was dirty, and he went straight over the chicane and he spun, and 
and he went in the wall. Mansell stayed in the cockpit of his car for a lap and showed Ayrton Senna what he thought about the incident as the leaders went by on the next lap. Knowing Senna was now free to take the win as he wished, Mansell was not much in a mood to discuss the matter with journalists. But he needn't have worried. Senna's hopes expired some 20 laps later as the Honda's electronics failed. Before the season was half over, what was left of Senna's World Championship chances now seemed definitely lost. But the Brazilian was still better off than Ivan Capelli. Miraculously, the Italian was unhurt. And what could have been a fine fifth place for Katayama ended up in fire and smoke when his engine blew up just eight laps before the end. Carl Wendlinger, however, made it to the end and scored a fourth place, his best ever result, and a big encouragement for the underfunded March team. But there was an even happier Austrian at the front of the race. With Patrese dropping out soon after Senna, Berger was the only survivor from the top two teams. Gradually pulling away from Schumacher, he scored his sixth Grand Prix win despite gearbox problems. A great day for Austria. Alessi was again on the podium, albeit due to others' misfortune this time, and De Cesaris repeated his fifth place from Mexico. Comas scored the first point for the Ligier team in 48 races, but Senna and McLaren were back. After two consecutive wins by McLaren, the return to Europe was eagerly awaited, even despite the French lorry driver's blockades. Some of the Grand Prix stars, including Michael Schumacher, used their time just before the French Grand Prix to look inside some of the marvellous castles in the region around the Magnicourt circuit. On the circuit itself, past and present FISA presidents were keen to help the Ferrari team back into winning mood. But on the track itself, Nigel Mansell was brushing aside his Canadian mishap and topping both qualifying sessions to take his seventh pole position of the season. Patrese was second once again, and Senna was once more way off Mansell's time. Schumacher was fifth, not too far away from the McLarens. The Germans shared everybody's concern just before the race. Heavy clouds gathered in the region and it seemed inevitable it would rain later in the afternoon. At the start, however, it was dry. Patrese made a perfect getaway and led the field through the first lap. For the first half of that first lap, everything was fine. But then, on the approach to the hairpin, two separate accidents happened. Still Patrese leading Mansell and the two McLarens but Schumacher was getting impatient. First, Schumacher hit Senna, eliminating him on the spot, and then Gasho, Wendlinger and Guzelmin all crashed into one another, adding to the confusion. Here is how Schumacher saw his crash with Senna. Back at the front of the field, Patrese and Mansell had soon left everybody else behind, but far from running according to any team orders, they seemed to be determined to battle for the lead. The leaders were eagerly watched from the sidelines by their greatest rivals. Berger had retired nine laps after Senna with engine problems. They enjoyed their pastime until rain drove them into the McLaren garage. In fact, it was now raining so hard that the race had to be stopped. Jean Lazy, fourth at the time, did what everybody else did, stopped on the dry spot under the bridge after the finish line. The race was to be restarted after everybody had changed to rain tyres, but in fact the sun appeared and it was to be a dry race again. As Griard blatantly jumped the start at the back, Patrese repeated his earlier performance and led once again. On down to the hairpin, Mansell was closing, and he went past. But he also went a little wide, and was passed again. Schumacher's fighting mood, meanwhile, finally waned as he tripped over Modernus Jordan at exactly the same place where he compromised his race early on. 
Here's his view once again. And here's the crash from another angle. On the next lap, Patrese waved Mansell through. After his earlier resistance, were there now team orders? And several laps later, the rain came back and everybody called in the pits for tyres. Except Alesi, who for many laps opted to stay on the slicks despite impossible conditions. He survived this big spin, but finally had to change his tyres. Only to retire six laps later with a blown engine. It was a sad end to a brilliant drive. Mansell, however, ended his brilliant drive in his usual style. Win number six on Renault's home soil was doubly important for Frank Williams and the team. The win was backed by Patrese's sister car and Brundle climbed the podium for the first time in his career. Officially, at least, both Hakkinen and Comas scored their best ever results. This time, not all the faces on the podium were particularly happy, especially not Patrese's. With Schumacher not scoring, Patrese was now firmly second in the championship. But more importantly, Mansell drew further away into what now seemed an uncatchable lead. In the team standings, Williams was of course in total control, but McLaren was again ahead of Benetton, if only slightly. But was there a reason behind Patrese waving Mansell through? So still no team orders at Williams? No comment about that. For Mansell, Silverstone was always going to be the highlight of his dominant season. He and his family were an obvious centre of attention during the whole of the British Grand Prix. He'd won twice earlier at Silverstone, and thousands of his fans expected nothing less this time. He responded magnificently. In qualifying, he was two seconds faster than everyone else. Yeah, I mean, a fantastic lap, uh, but I'm driving for a wonderful team, and uh, Renault have done a superb job. And here it's the circuit where you have to commit into the corners. They're very, very fast corners indeed. And, uh, you know, it suits my driving style. I'm here in my own country. And uh, as I've said to you before, that uh, I get the job done here. Patrese was fortunate to escape unhurt from an almighty accident with Eric Comas on Saturday morning. The two collided at Vale Corner. And here's how Patrese saw it all. Senna was third fastest again, but almost three seconds behind Mansell this time, while Schumacher squeezed into row two, pushing out Gerhard Berger. But at Silverstone, all anybody cared about was Nigel Mansell. The pressure was enormous, but he looked ready. At the green light, Patrese again started better and led into Cop's corner. But before the next corner, Maggots, Mansell took the lead. And he simply went away. Right from that first lap, his determination was enormous. And as others fought for lesser placings, he made sure nobody else should even think of coming close to him. All the way around the circuit, the crowds loved it. And on every lap, they showed their appreciation as their hero passed by. Behind Patrese, the real battle was raging for third spot between old Formula 3 rivals Brundle and Senna. Nigel Mansell made his scheduled tyre stop, and it wasn't a quick one. The Williams mechanics took almost 12 seconds over it. But it wasn't a problem. And when Mansell rejoined the race, he was still in the lead. Seven laps to go, and Senna's gearbox failed, just after he'd managed to pass Brundle. Team boss Ron Dennis was not impressed. It was another bad day for McLaren. 
but as the marshals pushed the McLaren away, the crowd didn't seem to mind too much. Just to add insult to injury, Mansell recorded fastest lap of the race with only two laps remaining, simply to please his fans. He was invincible and he knew it. And the place where he most wanted to show his superiority was here at home in front of the Silverstone crowd. Senna had to acknowledge that he was invincible too as he watched the last few laps. Just before the end, Mansell lapped for the fourth time Damon Hill, the son of the late Graham Hill. Hill, a Williams test driver but here in Abrabham, would finish his first Grand Prix in 16th place. And with his fans already celebrating, Mansell started to salute them before the end. Nothing would go wrong this time, and this would be his seventh victory of the year. It was also his 28th Grand Prix win, and he'd now surpassed Jackie Stewart as the most successful British driver ever. The huge Silverstone crowd would not have accepted any other result. Patrese was second once again, and Brundle repeated his result from France and beat his teammate Schumacher to the podium. Mansell had some problems reaching the podium, he didn't seem to mind. I mean, what can you say? I've never experienced that in my whole career anywhere in the world. And uh, I mean, they're fantastic, aren't they? It's just, uh, it's just incredible. He could hardly wait to show himself to the crowd. And they could hardly wait to see him. For the next round, could Michael Schumacher be lifted to glory by the German fans? But his weekend started badly, going off soon after the start of qualifying. Senna did no better, and other drivers suffered as well, victims of Hockenheim's new curves and chicane setups. Well, that's how the still reigning world champion did it. But Nigel Mansell made no such mistakes. He was fastest all the way, looking now for his eighth Grand Prix win of the year. If he could do it here at Hockenheim, that would put him level with Ayrton Senna's achievement in 1988. Patrese was second, as usual, and the McLarens filled the second row. Alasis Ferrari was a decent fifth, but a full three seconds slower than Mansell. Before the race, there was much pressure on local hero Schumacher, who in theory at least was still in the fight for the world title. As had become traditional recently, Patrese beat Mansell once more into the first corner. But the Englishman was going to repass him as soon as he possibly could. And round the first corner and up to the first straight, he set about the task. Obviously, he had every intention to dominate yet another race. Senna dealt in the same manner with his own teammate Berger, taking third place at the same spot. Soon, Mansell and Patrese were on their own, leading as they pleased. But before half distance, they were both going to have to change their tyres. And they lost their lead to Ayrton Senna, who decided to try to go through without a stop. Mansell caught the Brazilian quickly enough, but Senna proved difficult to overtake. His Honda engine was almost a match for the Renault, and his braking was as late as ever. It's one thing to catch up with Ayrton, but just as in Monaco and Canada, it's another thing to get past. And almost like Canada, Nigel nearly threw it away. Well, I mean, we're both side by side and uh, slipstreaming well over 200 miles an hour, and uh, Ayrton left his braking real late, I left mine quite late, and we almost both didn't make the corner. 
and uh, I thought at one time because his back end really stopped stepped out I thought maybe he's gonna go real sideways so I gave a bit more room and then slid wide myself <clears throat> it was interesting but uh, I mean Ayrton's a great great racing driver and uh, you know he doesn't let anybody pass easy after passing Senna Mansell started to pull away once again and meanwhile, his teammate Petrese had to make up for time lost in the pits by passing Schumacher. After struggling for several laps, he finally managed it under braking for the chicane and immediately set after Senna. Having caught the Brazilian, Petrese tried everything to go by, but to no avail. Then on the last lap, with Mansell only a few seconds ahead and visibly slowing, Patrese put everything into one last attempt to outbreak Senna into the stadium. But he failed dismally and lost everything. Mansell, on the other hand, routinely went on his way to clinch another win. He wasn't in trouble, he was just taking it easy. He finished just 4.5 seconds ahead of Senna, but it was enough for win number eight. Patrese's misfortune promoted a delighted Schumacher to third place at his home Grand Prix. Mansell now had 86 points, 46 more than Patrese, and was very close to winning the title. He could become the champion in Hungary. In qualifying on the twisty Hungara ring, Patrese was, for once, faster than Mansell. But this weekend, Nigel was playing it safe. Still, Mansell was not far behind, and he was still more than half a second faster than Senna. Schumacher again completed the second row. To win the title, Mansell needed to win in Hungary, or to finish third if Patrese failed to score. It looked easy, but the pressure was now really on. Patrick Head knew all about it. Three drivers had won titles in his cars earlier. Jones in 1980, Rosberg in 1982, Piquet in 1987. Mansell knew it was his turn finally. Would he make it this time? Uncharacteristically, he made a very slow start, allowing both Senna and Berger to go by and chase Patrese into the first corner. Fourth place wouldn't be enough to get the championship today. Belgian Eric van der Poel made a mess out of his debut for the Von Metal team. On lap eight, Mansell decided enough was enough, and he took third place from Berger. He was now after Senna, but the Brazilian, predictably, proved more difficult to pass. Mansell's cause wasn't helped by an uncooperative and lapped Martini. Alone in the 20-second lead, Patrese suddenly spun, lost a lot of time and dropped to seventh place. This changed the situation dramatically. If Mansell stayed third, he would be champion. If Patrese got back into the points, Mansell would have to pass Senna. But just as things looked good for him, Mansell had to change his tyres six laps later. Even though Patrese was now out with a blown engine, it seemed that the title was slipping from Nigel's hands. But he rejoined the race at a furious pace. He was now down in sixth place. He was helped a little by Schumacher losing his rear wing with dramatic consequences just two laps later. Thankfully, Schumacher was unhurt. The incident had probably been caused by Brundle gently nudging his teammate earlier in the race. Mansell quickly caught the fourth-placed Hakkinen and passed him on lap 66. He was now only one step from the title. On the next lap, he was with Brundle and passed him easily. He was third and potentially the world champion. 
but just to be on the safe side, Mansell decided he should pass Berger again. He did so, just, and he was now second. Senna, in the meantime, cruised safely to his second win of the season. Victory for McLaren. But Mansell finished his 176th Grand Prix race some 40 seconds later with a second place that was enough to clinch him his first world championship after 12 years of trying. A proud moment for him and for the team. And Roseanne Mansell was congratulated by Peter Windsor. Very good job. We're going to give you a hard time. Every opportunity. The outgoing champion Senna was the first to greet Mansell in Park Ferme. The Brazilian scored his 35th Grand Prix win after a fine race. His teammate Berger kept Brundel and Hakkinen at bay to finish third, but Mansell was the champion. Yeah, I mean, uh, what's more important is uh, all the fans out there and all the supporters for the years and uh, especially my country and and that this is all for you to all of us different feelings come and go um, but one thing that perhaps we all have in common apart from our differences personal difference is that we are all racers and we love our activity we we take chances we take risks we go through pain we we sacrifice lots of things in life just for the pleasure to be P1. So I know what's the feeling like. And uh, I think it's been a long time, long way for him, and uh, he finally got it, and uh, I think I know what's the feeling like. The driver's title was decided, but the championship continued. Spa welcomed Formula One with some stormy weather but not all the Grand Prix weekend had been like this. Friday morning was nice and sunny, but not for Eric Comas, who crashed heavily in the fast Blanchimont sweep before the pits. Ayrton Senna was the first to reach the scene of the crash, and he rushed to help the motionless Frenchman. Fortunately, Comas suffered only concussion and bruising, but he would take no further part in the Belgian Grand Prix. On Saturday, it was wet, and the drivers spent more time in the garages than on the track, and the talk was about the 1993 season. Prost has a contract, he has a clause in there that has a veto for me to drive, and uh, it's nothing you can do about it. He simply doesn't want to compete with me in the same car, and it's basically because he knows that in the same car is tough. To beat me he got, he got to have a different car and uh, that is sad because this is business of course but it's also some sport in it and um, considering that Williams is well ahead in technically speaking than anybody else it means that at the moment I have no alternative to compete with them with Prost uh, with another car some qualifying did take place and not surprisingly Mansell topped the times over two seconds ahead of Senna and much more ahead of the others the race started on a dry track, but rain was obviously threatening. At the green light, Mansell led Senna away. But further down the grid, the man who wasn't moving was Gerhard Berger. He never managed to move his clutchless McLaren from the line. His teammate Senna, meanwhile, took an early lead and managed to keep ahead of Mansell until the end of lap two. But then Nigel lined up behind Senna and bravely dived inside him at the entry to Blanchimont and took the lead. As it started to rain quite heavily, Patrese followed suit and passed Senna for second place. On 
the very next lap, the leaders were into the pits to change tyres, bringing chaos to the lap charts. More and more of them came in, but Senna stayed out. Then he too had to change tyres and dropped to 12th place, and as the rain stopped and the track started to dry, Schumacher had a quick off, damaging his tyres in the process. He decided to change them for dry ones. It was a momentous decision. On the fast drying track, Mansell delayed his tyre change for too long. By the time he came in, Schumacher was able to run away with the lead. On his dry tyres, Mansell did start to catch the German towards the end of the race. But then his Renault engine started to miss fire, and that destroyed all hopes for him of a win at Spa. So, by a combination of luck and clever tactics, Schumacher went on to win his first Grand Prix victory, exactly a year after his debut in Formula One on this very track. And he became the first German to win a Grand Prix since Jochen Mass in Spain 17 years before. And the Benetton team had scored their first win for more than a year. At the end, Mansell was more than half a minute behind Schumacher with Patrese third. Senna climbed back to claim two points. But for the Germans at Spa, it was a great day. I really can't describe it. I mean, it's something crazy. But I really have to say, in the, the whole weekend, I felt that we quite good. And I don't know why, but uh, when I was in the motorhome today, I thought uh, I'm able to win this race. But then I was effectively, I was actually in the race. I was just in uh, third and fourth position, and I thought, oh, uh, I, I think uh, my dream doesn't come up. And then suddenly uh, the situation changed. I went in for dry tires, and it was absolutely at the right moment, and uh, I could win the race. The world champion further increased his points lead after this race, but the battle for the second place now truly intensified, with Patrese, Schumacher and Senna all with good chances. The Williams team clinched the Constructors' title with the 10 points earned in Spa, but here as well, the runner-up spot was wide open. The Italian Grand Prix at Monza, a place of passion and tradition. And by tradition, some of the Grand Prix drivers had their annual soccer match against a team of selected journalists. Mansell and Schumacher, needless to say, once again stole the show. With speculation about his Formula One future reaching wild proportions, Mansell caused a minor sensation on Friday when he had a very public chat with McLaren's boss, Ron Dennis. But the bomb was finally to explode on Sunday morning, with Mansell holding a press conference. Due to circumstances beyond my control, I have decided to retire from Formula One at the end of this season. The news had yet to sink in, notably in his own team, but everybody had something to say about Mansell and his world title. He's probably, oh no, without doubt, the most electrifying of all the drivers. In my opinion, none of the previous three could get out of a car what he does when he's on a qualifying lap. Well, I think there's only one word. It's been excellent, you know. And he's won a lot of races. He's won the championship very early. Made a mistake in Brazil with Senna, but that's about it. Brilliant. Uh, the car is so, so good, and uh, also he has a uh, lot of confidence. He has no problem with his teammate, and uh, I think it should be okay, no problem. I'm just pleased that there's another British driver up there winning as often as Nigel is. I mean, he rates as, uh, you know, winning the first championship is always the most difficult one. It took Nigel quite a while to achieve it. But uh, he's, he's a real good world champion, I think, and it, he rates as high as any other world champion. I think it's been a great success and fully deserved. He's been uh, very aggressive behind the wheel and he's a very strong man and I think that's played a big part in this year's championship. Back on the track, Mansell was in fine form. Again, he dominated both days of qualifying, but it was not so sweet anymore. This time, Senna was not so far behind, and Alessi was third quickest in a very fast Ferrari, faster even than Patrese's Williams. Before the race, Alessi was not particularly relaxed. Always pressure on Ferrari drivers at Monza. 
Gerhard Berger wasn't relaxed either. He was obliged to start from the pit lane with last-minute engine problems. More bad luck for him. But at the green light, it was Mansell who finally led the race away. While Ayrton Senna quickly disposed of Jean Alesi. But the Brazilian was to prove unable to stay with Mansell, who slowly began to build up a sizeable lead. Behind him, on lap 14, Patrese caught Senna and smartly outbraked him into the first chicane. Then, seven laps later, Patrese mysteriously appeared in the lead. Mansell wasn't in trouble and was still pursuing him, but Ricardo Patrese was leading his home Grand Prix. The television replay showed what had happened. Mansell had deliberately waved his teammate past. Mansell continued to follow Patrese for 20 laps, but then suddenly pulled into the pits and retired with a hydraulic failure. What happened was the supply pressure for the gearbox just dropped, so then I was stuck in sixth gear, but it was a good race. I obviously let Ricardo Fern road shotgun for him because we spoke before the race and he did he wanted to win this one and i think now for sure he'll go on and uh, well i was going to help him win anyway but i'm out of the race and he's driving a fantastic race fantastic year and i uh, hope that he wins uh, out there with no problem at all but it was not to be as patrese slowed dramatically amid a shower of sparks he too had a hydraulic suspension problem it allowed senna to close right up and soon Senna was able to take the lead, just six laps to go to the end of the race. Patrese, however, decided he could finish the race, and he cruised slowly round, eventually to finish fifth. So Senna scored his third win of the season. He was lucky, but he was always close enough to the leading Williamses to be ready if anything happened. Brundle was second yet again, and Schumacher was a splendid third after having to pit early on and replace a broken nose cone. I'm very happy with my, my own race because I believe that um, with the car engine combination we had for us here, um, it was the very best I could get out of it today during the race. From the outset of the Portuguese Grand Prix, Mansell was determined to score yet another win and claim the record of nine victories in a season. Again, he dominated the qualifying and again by staggering margins. Patrese was relatively close, but Senna was again more than a second away. The new world champion was clearly relaxed just before the start, while the man who would replace him as the first Williams driver, Alain Prost, was visibly less relaxed with his temporary job. Green light. And once again, Mansell ruthlessly led the field. Patrese briefly stayed with him down to the first corner but then Mansell started to pull away from his teammate. Once again, it was looking so very easy for the Williams Renault team. Meanwhile, Schumacher had had to start from the back of the grid due to engine problems, but he was soon catching up. Here he passes the hapless Capelli in his last race for Ferrari. Tire stops were the order of the day. Ayrton Senna had to stop no less than four times during the race. Ricardo Patrese stopped only once, 
but his pit stop went badly wrong. For agonising seconds, he sat there while the Williams mechanic struggled with his wheels. And while he was there, he dropped from second place to fourth, behind the Austrian Gerhard Berger. While he was there, Martin Brundle stopped at the same time, although his pit stop went more on routine lines. But during all this excitement, that meant that the Lotus of Mika Hakkinen briefly held second spot, his highest ever race position. Then he too needed a stop and rejoined fifth. After his delay in the pits, Riccardo Petresi caught up quickly with Gerhard Berger's McLaren. Catching him was one thing, passing him would prove to be an entirely different matter. For several laps, the two were glued together in their battle. But awaiting Petresi was potentially the worst accident of his career. Then coming onto the top straight, it happened. Berger saw it this way. I couldn't say that it was my fault, I couldn't say it was Ricardo's fault, you know, it was just a misunderstanding. He went out from the last corner. I mean, you, you cannot put up the hand in the last corner. You have everything to do to have both hands on the steering wheel. And I went out and I, straight away, when I come out, I positioned the car straight away in the middle and uh, to go into the little bits. And I thought he's gonna come left because the last time when I looked to the mirror, it was quite a big gap still. And then I just entered the bits, and just when I was already nearly entering the bits, I feel a touch, and I, I just saw him flying over me, and I was really afraid, and I was sure that he's going to hurt himself, and I'm very happy now that, that he's okay. Patrese survived the crash badly shaken but completely unhurt. It was another testimony of exceptional solidity and strength in a modern Formula One car. Up in front, quite undisturbed by anybody, Mansell cruised to his ninth win. It was another record in the Mansell book. Berger eventually finished second, the only one who escaped being lapped by the winner. Senna's third place also pushed him into second place in the championship, albeit some 58 points behind Mansell. The championship battle may have been already decided, but the Japanese were still mad about Formula One. This year, there were 7 million applicants for the 150,000 available tickets. The qualifying was limited to Friday only due to heavy rains on Saturday, and Mansell was fastest again, despite this spin. It was his 12th pole of the season, inspired, no doubt, by the presence of rock singer Kim Wilde in the Williams garage. On their last showing on their home circuit, Honda, pulling out of Formula One after the Australian Grand Prix, suffered heavily from the Mansell-Williams-Renault combination. Senna was trailing by more than a second, but that didn't affect his mood or his popularity in Japan. The Williams teammates were again seen hatching a plot just before the race. But on the grid, the new world champion was once again quite relaxed while discussing his car's race setup with engineer David Brown. Mansell seemed to have come to grips with his starts now, because once again he led Patrese away at the green light. Two Williams Renaults, two McLaren Hondas, Schumacher's Benetton and Johnny Herbert up in sixth place in the Lotus.
just ahead of teammate Hackerman. Further back, Capelli's replacement at Ferrari, Nicola Larini, had to be pushed started after stalling the engine on the grid. Senna's race lasted less than three laps. His Honda engine seized while he was lying third, not what the Japanese wanted to see in their home Grand Prix. And Mansell went on to build up a handsome lead over the first 20 laps and looked all set for another win. Ayrton Senna could just watch it on TV. His teammate Berger ran well, but had to pit for fresh tyres twice in the race. And Schumacher lasted only 13 laps before his gearbox packed up. Remember LaRousse Venturi drivers Gasho and Katayama and their adventures from Canada? Incredibly, they did it again, this time fighting for 11th place. Frank Williams was not impressed, but he was even less impressed when he saw Mansell's car engulfed in flames and slowing into retirement. The Englishman had again let Patrese through several laps earlier, and as at Monza, had hit trouble soon afterwards. Patrese was now on his own, but Hakkinen's Ford engine blew up. He'd been lying third at the time, just as his Lotus teammate Johnny Herbert had been when he retired earlier. Mansell had just enough time to return to his garage and change before the end of the race. But this time Patrese did keep going. His car held together and he finally won his first race of the season. It was some recompense for his nasty scare in Portugal. And he took the chequered flag in his 239th Grand Prix. The first man to meet him and congratulate him after that race was Nigel Mansell. Despite all of Formula One's pressures, here are two teammates who have remained friends. Berger finished second and gave some consolation to Honda, while Brundle was on the podium once again. But Patrese was a relieved winner. I was very scared that something could happen to me again, like it happened to me in Monza. So, uh, really, also if they were easy, they were not so easy in, in the head, the, the last six, seven laps. The final stop for the championship, Adelaide, Australia. And with his spirits lifted, Riccardo Patrese was keen to enjoy a gentle build-up to the race. Brighter, more relaxed than most other races, and always colourful, the Australian Grand Prix has always been eagerly awaited at the end of the season. And among the famous spectators, motorcycle champion Wayne Gardner was there too, visiting Lotus. For Nigel Mansell, this year's race was going to be very special, his last Grand Prix, at least for a while. He took it as seriously as any other and duly clinched his 13th pole position of the season. But on Saturday, it was Ayrton Senna who was fastest. But the times were slower that day. He had to accept second spot in what would for him probably also be the last race for at least a year. The difference between the two was less than usual and looked promising for the race. Patrese was third, Berger fourth, just fractionally faster than Schumacher. Well, that was quick enough this afternoon in qualifying. We think we've got a couple of reasons why we weren't quick enough. But whichever way you carve it up, those guys next door on the red and white cars are very close. Tomorrow should be great. To I hope it's going to be a great race to watch. There were some emotional scenes just before the start as Mansell greeted his mechanics for the last time. Outgoing world champion Ayrton Senna was pensive. 
while former world champions on four and two wheels, Alan Jones and Barry Sheen, were enjoying the scene. One by one, the cars came up to their grid positions. It had been a long, long year, and this would be the 16th and final start. Come the green light, Mansell never allowed Senna to edge ahead and cleanly took the lead. And in the midfield, Griar spun and promptly collected the luckless Martini into an early retirement. Senna was pushing Mansell as hard as he could, even in these early stages. On the first lap, he tried to outbreak him. Got past, but ran wide. But clearly, in this race, the McLaren was able to hang on to the Williams. Mauricio Gugelman's season ended less than ideally with brake failure on the Jordan. For 18 exciting laps, Mansell and Senna ran nose to tail, but then it all ended rather abruptly. Mansell's race engineer, David Brown, took it hard. It didn't seem a fitting end or even a fitting temporary break for two fine careers. Here's the replay of the crash that was sure to ignite various interpretations. And here's what Nigel Mansell made of it all. I'm very, very disappointed. I had everything under control. You can't do any more than lead the race from the start until the point where you're taken out. He tried the overtaking manoeuvre at the end of the straight and almost went off himself and I saw him come in, had to pull over to the left. I mean, I'm just disgusted with the whole thing and I've got nothing really further to add except I'm just glad I'm going home. Senna was less public, but no less eloquent. Suddenly, the second drivers, Patrese and Berger, were disputing the lead and almost in the same way as their team leaders. It didn't work for Berger any more than it had for Senna. And De Cesaris's good season with Tyrrell ended like this while Patrese lost a healthy lead when his fuel pressure dropped on lap 50. Thus, Berger inherited the lead, just as in Canada. But this time, he had Schumacher chasing him hard to the flag. Berger was forced to slow considerably due to fuel consumption problems. And Schumacher failed to catch him by just seven-tenths of a second at the end of a very dramatic end to a long and dramatic season. Honda thus won their last Grand Prix, and both Benetton drivers finished on the podium once again. But for Berger, a second win in Australia. Now today, of course, I hurt, hurts a lot because to leave somebody where you just win a race, it's always a very difficult thing. But uh, I'm going to have a big party with my boys today and have some fun. So Mansell almost doubled the points of the championship runner-up, who in the end turned out to be Ricardo Petrese. Schumacher pushed Senna from third place, and Berger almost caught up with his teammate. Among the teams, McLaren finally overtook Benetton, but the latter managed to score points in every race of the season, the first time that's been achieved since 1963. After Australia, some had a rest, but most went on working hard. For the new season, starts off in February, once again in South Africa.
Okay, well, what we've got here now, Michael, we've got the stiffer rear bar on, we've got the unbalanced in nose, and we've got a new set of tyres.